Hello, and welcome to today's discussion on challenges to the industrial base during COVID-19. I'm Andrew Hunter, Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at CSIS, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Uh, I encourage you, to, if you get an opportunity, to check out our previous events on this topic, uh, including uh, an April 27th discussion that I and Todd Harrison had with Mackenzie Mac Eaglin of AEI on the topic of the defense budget and the defense supply chain. Uh, and I also encourage you to check out our COVID response updates at our Defense 360 microsite uh, at CSIS. And I want to let you know that this event was made possible by general support to CSIS. Uh, we're very appreciative of all those uh, who support the center and allow us to put on events such as today's. Uh, I'm joined today by three very influential industry CEOs uh, who can walk us through the view from industry, from the folks actually managing through this crisis uh, with the industrial base. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce each of them in turn, uh, and they're going to start by just giving us a brief update on the view from their vantage point industry of where we are today. Uh, then we're going to move into an interactive discussion of four key topics. Uh, first, COVID impacts on operations. Uh, second, effectiveness of the government's response. Third, implications of the war for of this crisis for, on the war for talent. And last, uh, risks and opportunities for the future. We will be taking audience questions at the end of our session, and you could submit those questions through our event page. Uh, there's a link on the event page uh, to a Google form where you can submit the questions, and I welcome you to do so. I'm going to begin the session uh, first with Mitch Schneider. Mitch is president and CEO of Bell and a member of Textron's corporate leadership team. Uh, prior to his current uh, position as CEO, uh, he was the executive vice president at Bell for their military business, all of their government programs. Uh, before that, he served in leadership uh, in a wide variety of manufacturing uh, programs at Bell, including the V-22, uh, and his background in industry stretches back to uh, some time with Lockheed Martin, where he worked in the F-16 office uh, and did a, a significant amount of overseas sales work. Uh, it's probably worth noting that uh, right on the right at the beginning of much of the shutdown activity around the country, uh, Bell was awarded two major contracts by the United States Army in their Future Vertical Lift program for the FARA and FLARA programs. Uh, and so uh, it's a pretty unique perspective for a manufacturing company uh, beginning uh, this struggle with uh, two big two big wins in those competitions. Uh, Mitch, if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving us a few minutes of thoughts on your perspective at this point in time. Yeah, great. Thank you, Andrew. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, everybody out there is uh, still safe and healthy and getting through this pandemic. Uh, very, very much concerned about everyone, not only in the panel, but on also uh, out there in our general audience. So thanks for having us. Uh, as you know, Bell is uh, an innovation technology company. We've been uh, creating flight for about 85 years. In fact, we're going to be celebrating our 85th birthday uh, this July. Uh, but we're also, as you mentioned, a manufacturing company. So most of our revenue comes from uh, what we make and sell. So as we entered this uh, pandemic, we were designated an essential business, which means we need to come to work and, and continue to execute. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, we also won uh, two major contracts, which we were very excited about. Probably didn't get as much, um, you know, fanfare as you would normally because uh, the headlines were really around COVID. But we, we were very excited to win those and, and support the Army and their modernization. But as we entered this, this phase, we said, hey, we've got to be really deliberate and proactive of how we handle this. And we really set down three objectives that we want. First and foremost, um, we need to keep our employees safe. Uh, so whatever we do as we work through this, we've got to make sure our employees are safe. Secondly, uh, we want to do our part and stop the spread uh, of this, this virus. So we really need to, to do what we need to do in that area. And the third is we've got to support our customers. Um, you know, we have our military services that we support, the warfighters out there, as well as the first responders on our commercial side of the business with emergency medical helicopters and, and law enforcement, et cetera. So, we said, hey, we've got to make sure that no matter what we do, we we're able to accomplish that. And so we established a COVID task force. We wanted to make sure that uh, we thought about everything, stay in, in touch with CDC, uh, our government, uh, local government, state, regional. You know, we actually have offices in other countries. We've got to stay in tune with all that. So we really wanted the task force to bring that together um, and make sure that we are doing everything we can, keeping everybody informed. We also... Uh, 
established, I think like most people did, you know, we complied, we got to work from home. So a lot of our office workers were out. So we had our office workers work from home. We actually do a, uh, a, a discussion where I talk to all 400 plus leaders of Bell every other week anyway for 90 minutes. So we already had some of this IT and facilitation in place and we just ramped it up so we could do this twice a week now and, and have COVID specific discussions. So we, we enabled that. Uh, again, working with government partners, clear guidance. I think the last thing that I did want to mention too, though, is that uh, uh, the message to all of our employees was we can hunker down and try and weather this out, or we can really embrace this situation and understand what it is. Um, there's a lot of, of fear out there. We get, we need to lead with empathy, but this is also a chance where we can take an opportunity to learn from it and make sure that the company is better when we come out of it. So that's kind of a quick overview is how we, we kind of oversaw this going into it. Thank you very much, Mitch. Uh, Thank you. And we'll turn next to Nazik Keen, and I'd give Nazik a brief introduction. Nazik is CEO of SAIC uh, and has been since August of 2019. Uh, before that, she was the Chief Operating Officer of SAIC. Uh, before that, President of the Global Markets and Missions Sector. And then before that, Senior Vice President for Corporate Strategy. So she's moved up the ladder quickly. Uh, but uh, methodically at SAIC. So glad you could join us today, Nazik. You know, SAIC is a business that focuses very much, uh, well, across the sector, but very much in the professional services area and providing direct support to military, cu military customers on military installations. Uh, so uh, it definitely brings a very interesting perspective to this uh, conversation and an additional perspective. Prior to her time at SAIC, Nazik uh, led the growth of CGI in the United States. It's uh, extensive growth. Uh, and she has a, a long background in IT and other high value services uh, for uh, for corporate customers. Nazik, uh, your perspective. Perfect, thank you, Andrew. And, and thanks for the invitation to, to join the conversation today. This is obviously incredibly relevant and I know is taking tremendous mind share and thought from all of us on this call. It's also just an honor to be here with, uh, with Mitch and Hawk uh, to be on this panel. So thank you for that. Um, as you know, as you're going to hear from all of us, uh, living and working through the impacts of this this particular crisis, COVID-19, on our society, on our workplace, has been challenging without question. Uh, like every organization out there, uh, we had extensive business continuity plans. We practiced them. We had them, you know, drawn up. But I don't know that any of us could have planned for this particular event, uh, you know, that hopefully only happens every hundred years or whatever they're contemplating. Uh, but I will tell you that I'm really proud of how SAIC has really stepped up and, and moved very quickly. Uh, much like you heard, our, our number one priority, you know, the day we started contemplating how to navigate this was the safety and well-being of our employees. And um, and certainly uh, that, that really informed and shaped every decision we made uh, on that day one for us. But also balancing that, as, as you mentioned, Andrew, we work hand in glove with our customers and, and uh, you know, on their, on their sites and with them every day. So balancing that with our responsibilities to our customers, our communities, our shareholders, and then ultimately to each other to ensure that we're keeping each other safe. Uh, we, we were fortunate and are fortunate that we did have an infrastructure that allowed this teleworking concept. We've been recognized by our flexible work environment and our ability to do that. And so, um, so we were able to quickly adjust. Uh, but again, nobody contemplated you'd be adjusting for this many employees within a day or two. Uh, and we also have about 60% of our workforce. So the majority of our workforce is situated at our customer sites. And so it was you know, just imperative that we had to work with our customers and partner with them as they too were dealing with this immediate need to work in a different fashion, to work from home and to find different ways of doing the social distancing. So. So it really was a collaborative effort amongst our SAIC colleagues, but absolutely hand in glove with our customer that uh, that allowed us to to be successful and continue to drive the work that we've been able to do. Um, it was also very evident that uh, that the employees wanted to take care of each other, and we saw that very early on and take care of our customers. And so we quickly stood up, uh, as you heard from Mitch, we stood up a task force as well, and we looked at ways that we could quickly allow employees to give and give back to each other. Uh, we put an employee leave donation program in place so that employees could donate their leave uh, for those uh, for those that uh, had to take time off because instantly they were the teachers, they were the caregivers, and uh, and of course looking out for their own health. 
Uh, so our employees have donated thousands and thousands of hours. We've matched uh, many of those. And so we've created this bank that employees can tap into to ensure they, they uh, maintain their livelihood. Uh, you know, we also look for the opportunity to support our, uh, you know, we're, we're principally across the U.S. Uh, we have some folks international, but most of our employees are U.S. based. And they want to find ways to give back to some of these communities that were struggling so much with P PPE. And so we leveraged our 3D printing capability uh, to manufacture face shields and, and other PPE for the, for the communities. And the employees really took that on. And then, of course, we pivoted our, uh, our corporate giving program, which many companies have done, to ensure that our corporate giving was go going to those organizations that were in need most desperately today. So looking at opportunities to help feed children, uh, provide uh, food banks and, co and contributing to the food banks. And then, again, this drastic need for PPE across, uh, across the communities. And so, um, so the, the employees have really come together. Uh, we've seen just a tremendous energy around looking for opportunities to give back, uh, give to each other, and give to their communities. We've also seen an increase in, in some of the stress levels in our employees. There's the stress that comes with working from home and the challenges that, uh, that are on many people and the, the pressures that come with social, social isolation. So we've also looked to tailor our wellness programs to ensure that we can have uh, take long-term care of our employees. So. So it's been a, it's been an incredibly busy few months. Um, the, uh, on the, on the day that, uh, mid-March when we sent everybody home, so to speak, uh, was also our first day of implementing or integrating a, uh, an acquisition that we had just, con just concluded, Unisys Federal. And so it's not every day that you, you know, you write a one plus billion dollar check for an acquisition and then send everybody home. And so we've, uh, we've been navigating that integration. Uh, across the enterprise um, in, the, in a different way than we normally would do in an acquisition, but that's taken a tremendous amount of energy and focus as we want to make sure that that, that enterprise feels connected to SAIC. The good news is uh, Unisys Federal brought SAIC greater strengths in IT, IT modernization, uh, leveraging the cloud, and uh, as you can imagine, that is certainly forefront, and we'll get into later where, you know, where we're seeing the government go. But that's top of mind as we continue to look for the opportunities to support our government customer, as well as ensure that we're best uh, equipped for what will be ultimately a new normal, whatever that is, whenever we get there. But that's certainly top of mind. So I'm incredibly proud of, of what SAIC has done, the employees, how they've stepped up to support the defense, the intelligence, the space, and civilian markets. And, uh, and we'll continue to look for, uh, for ways to support that. I do want to take just a quick second and, and thank uh, General Hawk Carlisle and the NDIA, NDIA team for supporting this industrial base and for advocating the well-being and livelihood for all of us who continue to support the, the incredibly important missions of the DOD and the other, um, you know, certainly the other uh, aspects of the federal government through this pandemic. Uh, it, has been, it has been a tremendous partnership, and we look forward to uh, continuing to do that as we all navigate this crisis together. So look forward to the questions and the conversation, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Well, thank you, Nazik. And that's a great transition uh, to uh, General Carlisle, uh, General Hawk Carlisle, uh, U.S. Air Force retired, who is president and CEO of the National Defense Industrial Association uh, and has served in that capacity since June of 2017. Uh, prior to his current position, uh, General Carlisle was, uh, as I mentioned, a U.S. Air Force General, uh, formerly commander of Air Combat Command and also commander of Pacific Air Forces. Uh, and as I went through his extensive resume on the NDIA website, uh, I, I, I noted that it seems like he's held almost every job in the United States Air Force uh, over the course of a 39-year career. So absolutely uh, amazing background. He's a U.S. Air Force Academy graduate. Uh, and has several additional degrees and certificates, including from Syracuse, MIT, uh, and George Washington University, as well as uh, some of the staff and war colleges within uh, DOD. So uh, again, I also experienced a little bit of education envy going through your background, General. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as Nazik mentioned, NDIA has been a, a core part of the industry uh, groups that have been working with the Department of Defense leadership during the COVID crisis to uh, address identify uh, and anticipate and mitigate uh, some of the challenges. In general, I'll turn it to you next. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, I got to tell you, I'm incredibly honored to be on this panel. Thank you for the invite and with Nazik and uh, Mitch, two incredible leaders in the defense industrial base, two great companies, uh, Bell and SAIC. So it, it's an honor to be here. I think um, 
you know, your lead in to me is one my mother would be proud of. But I think uh, I think the notion of all the jobs I held just means that I'm old and I hung around a long time. So uh, it was an honor and a privilege to serve. And it's an honor and privilege to be where I'm at now. So, you know, NDIA, we're a nonprofit 501c3. We represent small, medium, and large business. Uh, we want to bring together the defense industrial base that's critical for the support to the warfighters. Ultimately, I think everybody on this call uh, wants to make sure those young women and men out there serving our country are given the equipment, the training, capability to do the mission we ask them to do. So we bring together those parts of the federal government, Congress, the Department of Defense, the executive branch with defense industrial base and the academic community to try to make sure we do that in the best way possible and we continue to have the best defense industrial base in the world. So during this pandemic, the communicate and convene and build support and relationships is a key component. Um, you know, I think uh, communicate, communicate, communicate is something you can't do enough of. The DOD is the largest organization in the world, and the defense industrial base in the United States is the largest in the world. And so communicating across those two entities is a huge part of what we do every day. We're on calls um, every week with uh, OSD. We're talking to the executive branch every week. We're reaching out to our members. We've done multiple surveys. Um, we're really just trying to support that communication and convening. We just held our virtual Special Operations Forces Industry Conference, which was, uh, you know, a five-week sprint from the, one of the largest conferences in the in the world uh, for the defense industrial base to do it all virtually. And, and again, it was a great partnership with SOCOM. But uh, that's the kind of things we've been working on is making sure that we're getting that information out Um a lot of your questions we're going to talk about today will highlight some of the things that are challenges. You know, I mean, it, it, in this challenging time, you have individual contracting officers trying to deal with contracts. You have companies with several different contracts and different contracting officers, and nobody knows exactly um, what the right approach is, what's allowable, what's not, whether it's the PPE requirements or the equitable adjustments or allowable delays or 3610. So it's it's trying to continue to communicate, and I really appreciate Nasek saying uh, kind things about NDIA and us, but it really is about making sure we do everything we can to support our members in the Department of Defense by making sure we can communicate at every level and get as much information as humanly possible out there. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy as a general rule, and I'm a firm believer that you know, we've got a bunch of great Americans trying to do this and trying to make it through here. And the only reason it doesn't always work is probably because we're not communicating properly or somebody doesn't understand another point of view. So that's really what NDA is trying to do. I hope everybody's healthy and happy out there. Uh, our work has uh, probably significantly increased in NDIA to try to overcome this. Uh, and uh, i got to tell you, my uh, 80 folks at headquarters are – working uh, around the clock uh, to make sure we do that and communicate as much as possible. So, again, it's great to be here. I truly appreciate this opportunity. I look forward to the questions, and I'm honored to be on the panel with everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just move us into the next phase, which is uh, our first kind of discussion topic that I mentioned, which is impacts of COVID on, on business operations. And I think each of you touched a little bit on the impacts that you saw uh, at, at the beginning uh, and, and those that you've uh, continued to see. I'm interested a little bit in hearing about whether you see uh, the general raise the issue of consistency uh, across the system, across the network, if you will, uh, and that you can, uh, you know, it's a challenge, obviously, to maintain consistency for all involved, uh, but it's also potentially a challenge because uh, it's a challenge for, from a communication perspective, but it's also potentially a challenge because the crisis is manifesting in different ways in different areas. Uh, and I'd be interested in your perspective a little bit on that. One thing that has been concerning to me as an observer uh, is, you know, the, the extreme impact on the aviation sector that we've had with the, you know, kind of sudden stop in air travel uh, and how that's rippled through uh, that sector of the economy. That's a sector that's tied pretty closely to uh, defense industry. Uh, but similarly in, in other parts of industry. So if we could talk a little bit, uh, about how you see uh, the, the effects varying uh, by industry sector or by part of the supply chain uh, that's supporting 
uh, the work you see in industry. And uh, why don't we go back in reverse order here? We'll start uh, with you, Hawk, uh, and work our way back uh, uh, from the panelists. Well, thanks, Andrew. Great point. Um, you know, I think it, your point's well taken. Small, medium, and large are all affected differently. Um, manufacturers versus professional services versus supply chain are all uh, uh, having different challenges. I'll tell you, I think the smalls are taking a, a seriously cha a, a big challenge are, they're facing here, as well as some of the supply chain that are third and fourth tier down the supply chain. I think DOD did a great job with um, uh, progress payments and moving them up to 90 and 95 percent for bigs and for subs and I think uh, they're doing a good job. We've been on discussions with DLA and DPC as well as the service acquisition executives. And they're really trying to expedite payment to get them out in fewer days because cash flow is a big problem. Liquidity is a big problem. Uh, I, aviation, I believe we're going to have to do something as a nation to maintain our lead in the aviation industry. I think public-private partnerships, what it looks like, um, you know, you, the Boeing article today about how many folks uh, they're having to lay off. Most of those are in the commercial sector, not in the defense sector. But I think that's uh, heavily hit. I think um, the services sector is, you know, I mean, I think their demand signal for them is actually going up in some ways, but their ability to perform on contract is a challenge. Uh, so I think that's another part that's going to be a, a big player I, I do think that, uh, you know, Congress and DOD can do a lot in, in and it, it's not about handouts. It's more about executing the money to the quick, quickest way they can. There's a, there's a hundred and some odd billion dollars of obligated funds that haven't been, uh, I mean, uh, appropriated funds that haven't been obligated yet. If we can expedite the, the, uh, for the ability to do that to bring contract capability forward to um, maybe put more money into SBIRs, maybe put more money in transition. Um, so some of those things that we can do to try to uh, continue the liquidity and keep the modernization of the force and support the warfighter going, uh, but we're going to have to be quick and we're going to have to be agile. We're going to have to be flexible to make that happen. So those are kind of the things that I see. We've done some surveys, and I will tell you, small business and some of the supply chain um, uh, we got to watch out for them. We're going to have to take good care of them to get them out the other side and have them being reliable, resilient, and available um, because this has taken a big hit to some of those, uh, those smaller companies and so, uh, certain parts of the supply chain. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning those surveys. I, I should mention, as a researcher, it's incredibly valuable to me to have that real-time data coming in from the industrial base. That, that's a great thing for if folks haven't looked at them uh, to explore. Nazik, how does it look from where you sit? Yeah, so I um, I just have to agree with everything that uh, that Hawk said. Um, I think a couple things that I'll add. Um, you know, you talked about consistency, and certainly, um, you know, there was zero consistency because none of us knew what to do on day one. Uh, so I can tell you that over the course of the last whatever it's been, sixty to ninety days at this point. Um, uh, because of organizations like NDA, because of organizations like PSC, uh, some of the work that uh, uh, leadership that Ellen Lord provided in really trying to, you know, get some greater consistency, we, you know, we are in a much, much better place uh, as it relates to guidance for the contracting office. Uh, but with that being said, there's still, um, you know, there's there's good guidance, but there's not a lot of specific rules in some cases, and so it's left to some interpretation at the contracting office level. And I think you touched on this earlier that. You know, if you've got a contract in the same office, you might get two different, you know, two, two different senses of how that's going to navigate. And so I think there's still more work to be done, but I, I, we've made great progress, and I appreciate everybody's work in, in helping make that happen. And not only for us uh, on this side of the equation, but I think it provides immense clarity and help to the contracts office as well, uh, because I, 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 too, believe that everybody wants to do the right thing, um, and everybody's trying to navigate this in the best possible way for uh, for ultimately the you know the, the customer or federal government and so um, so I think we've we've seen a lot of good progress on the small business side I could not agree with you more in cases where we get accelerated payments you know we are trying to aggressively push that out and to make sure that uh, our small business communities uh, can navigate this um, we're, we're fortunate uh, you know all of us um, uh, represent organizations that are of size or scale that we will weather this. Um, but there are a lot of companies that may not, and, and I think um, and a lot of those companies bring great innovation, bring great 
thought leadership. And I think to the extent that we can, um, you know, that we can work together to protect this ecosystem is a good thing. Um, the other thing I'll note for a company like SAIC, because DOD is certainly the significant portion of our revenue, uh, but, uh, but we also work in the intelligence community and there's some different, you know, different nuances that come with working in that, uh, where you've got, you know, the, the, just the nature of that business. We work for civilian agencies and again, every agency might have a different approach to how they navigate this. And so, uh, so I think the consistency is much better. Uh, I think there's still some work we can do, and especially if we just fundamentally believe, which is, sounds like what we're hearing, that we're going to be navigating this in some form or fashion for the next several months or whatever that might <laughs> might turn out to. Um, but uh, but I think in general we've, we've made good progress, but look forward to some more. Thank you. Mitch? Yeah, so uh, if you look at what we're doing here, interesting enough, you know, uh, we're very fortunate in the fact that, you know, we've got a – uh, commercial and military business, and much of what you see happening on the commercial aviation side of the business is also impacting us uh, on our commercial uh, helicopter business. And so we have seen that market uh, get really soft on us. Uh, it's interesting enough that the uh, issue we're having early on was deliveries. It wasn't that, uh, that anybody was canceling any orders. It was we couldn't get the aircraft to them. Uh, they couldn't fly over to get them. We couldn't transport them to, to them. So that made it uh, impact up front, but then the orders are softening for next year's. But again, back to the fact that we're balanced, we have a military business that's very strong. And as, as, uh, you know, the panel associates here mentioned, Hawk and, and Mazik, that, you know, the government did accelerate those payments for us. And, you know, like I said, what, what, even though it wasn't consistent across all the services or different contracting agencies, we did see a big influx of, of cash flowing into us, uh, as a result of those to our military contracts. And, Again, we did the same thing everyone else has done. We got to fl flow that down. And interesting enough, we contacted over, you know, thousand suppliers individually. We actually brought additional folks on board. We wanted to actually talk to them personally. So we reached out and called everybody individually. And, and at this point right now, we have 90% of our supply base is still working, uh, which is great and work through that area. So we're, we know exactly down to the handful of those that aren't and what we need to do to work around those particular issues. Uh, we also have big factory operations in Canada and Mexico. Uh, so we really had to work closely with Commerce State, DOD, others to make sure those extended supply chains into those countries were also deemed essential and working. So we worked with the government on that as well. So again, it was, it was, uh, I think the action so far has really been very positive and allowed us to accelerate that military business, cover our downside on the commercial business and, and keep the supply base working and, like I said, we're still monitoring them all closely right now. We do have, you know, we're still working on like different withholds. Are those going to get pulled forward? Uh, we have seen some movement in definitizing contracts a little quicker uh, than we had seen in the past. So uh, I think it's been very, very proactive and, and very positive so far. That's good to hear. Um, are there under the radar things that are, you know, Mitch, you kind of raised the issue of the international supply chain. Uh, and that, that was one that kind of snuck up, I think, on a lot of folks that, you know, when, uh, you know, when states in Mexico might have had different guidance to, to their defense industry than what, you know, what we saw here in the United States that was hopefully fairly uniform, although, uh, you know, that, that depends a lot on states to, to follow federal guidance, uh, which they don't have to follow in many cases. Uh, but, but my understanding is in the U.S. case, you know, by and large, states and localities did follow the recommendation that, Defense designation of defense industry as critical infrastructure, uh, which was very effective. But you know, different rules apply. Obviously, when you're looking at Canada, Mexico, uh, and international supply chains, uh, I'm just uh, so you know that's an issue. You've addressed it a little bit, but are there other kind of under the radar things that have popped up that uh, you know, as Nazik indicated, this was not something something that was in some ways planned for, but which yeah. is wholly new uh, in many ways to that came up and got us. So what are the kind of the under the radar things, Mitch, if you wouldn't mind starting? Yeah, no, I can just add a couple of things here. One, one of them, again, like you said, we mentioned is uh, how different each region, different countries were addressing the situations. And so I think we, as we establish this, we got to look uh, not only even across the U.S., you know, there, even California at times, we're still shutting down essential businesses that were you know, providing parts. So we really had to get that that guidance out to everyone. And again, the government really worked with us to help provide that additional guidance. But you're, you're right. I mean, even in Mexico, for example, uh, the federal still says, you know, aviation is not necessarily an essential business, yet the, the, the state of Chihuahua says, hey, we need you to work. So 
uh, we've been navigating through all those those situations. And I think, you know, as we look just, I'll throw one out here and I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel, but, you know, as you start thinking through, we start saying, okay, now as the economy is opening back up, uh, how are we handling that as we go through? So some of the end of the radar is even though maybe we, we, we're opening up, but is the child care centers opening up at the same rate we are? So there's other things that are a little more, you wouldn't say were the direct impacts, but they are indirect impacts to how our employees get back to work. So uh, those are some other things that we're monitoring as we figure out our return to work plan uh, in addition to to what you would say, okay, but it's just, you know, we're opened up, get back to work. Uh, there's there's still other underlying issues that we're having to address out there. Plus, we don't want a second wave to hit. So we don't want to change too many variables at once. So as we start bringing our workforce back on and everybody's getting back out in the economy again, uh, there's going to be more contacts that happen and that get potentially brought back in our workforce. So we're watching that. Thank you. Isaac. Um... Anything under yeah, the radar so, that you've been noticing? Yeah, I think you touched on a couple of those, Mitch, that uh, that I was going to as well. We don't, um, you know, again, most of our employees are in the U.S. We certainly have employees that are overseas, but usually in conjunction with um, with military bases and, and in support of our uh, customers. So, but uh, to your point, you know, you don't you don't think about the fact that even though you're going to send all your employees that can, uh, not every not everybody could, and we had to do social distancing on customer sites and our sites. But to those that uh, you had to send home, again, you don't you don't plan for the fact there is no daycare, uh, there is no schools, and so you know you you've got uh, working parents that have become teachers immediately, and have become daycare providers, and have become. Um, you know, camp counselors and all those things. Meanwhile, you know, we're still expecting them to work and deliver on their customers' obligations. And so, um, so that certainly has been something that, um, and it's, you know, that's very challenging to navigate because you can't send somebody to go watch the kids. And so, um, and so there, you know, that's where it just becomes very important to have the flexibility in the work model and the flexibility in how they deliver their work and what hours they work and how they get that done and flexibility to tap into some additional leave options and, and, and things like that. Because, again, it's just not something you, you tend to contemplate uh, when you're planning for some of these scenarios. So that certainly has been something um, that, uh, you know, that we've navigated and tried to provide as much flexibility as we can for the workforce. Uh, as, uh, as with your business, you know, most everything we do is considered essential services. Um, we are a people-centric business. And so we, you know, we don't tend to manufacture a lot of things. It really is uh, technology-enabled um, people, talented people. And so it's it's really navigating that uh, the people ecosystem to ensure that they can work, that they can support their customers, they can do what they have to do. They've got the tools, technologies, access to the network, security infrastructure, whatever that might be, instantaneously in a different environment. And um, and so really rallying around that, I think, is something that uh, is is you know, something that you just don't tend to contemplate in, in some of the uh, scenario planning. Colonel Carlisle. Yeah, great, uh, great question. And I couldn't agree more with what Nizek and uh, Mitch said, reference certainly with child care and, and, and schools and things like that. I think the other thing, though, is what the new normal is going to be like, the wave that, that you know, we, we certainly don't want a second wave. We're all praying that that doesn't happen. But um, PPE, the uniform use of PPE and social distancing inside of different workspaces, whether it's, you know, uh, SAIC, SAIC folks working inside of government facilities or the manufacturing floor for Bell or any of those, um, what's it going to look like in this new normal? Is, you know, you're only going to be able to have half the people there at any given time. You're going to have to change your schedules. Are you going to be able to produce on time? Are you going to have, is you're going to get an allowable delay? What's an, what's an uh, equitable adjustments? What's an allowed expense? It's going to be a challenge as we go forward. Um, and we talked a little bit about consistency. And again, I, I give government a whole lot of credit, but consistency across, you know, what's acceptable PPE uh, when you go into the workplace? Is it what, you know, is each place going to deem that differently? Um, or is it all the same? Who's going to pay for all the PPE that you have to use? Where's that? Is that part of an allowable expense? So all of that is part of the discussion I think we're going to have to have as a new normal. And then the last thing I'll add to that then becomes one that I think um, much of industry is really concerned about, and certainly small business, is liability. If you follow the CDC guidelines, you follow the guidelines of the PPE for the, the government the entity that you're working for, you go into the workspace, 
and somebody, you know, you hope it doesn't happen, but somebody does get sick. And where's the liability? What's the liability coverage and, and how do companies uh, cover that? Again, I think, you know, the bigger companies probably have a better capability to do that, but some of those small businesses are forward. So, uh, and again, government's addressing this, but these are some of the challenges, this, the under the radar stuff that people are really starting to think about now and work their way through. Well, thank you for that. And, and you've kind of, I guess, uh, made a great segue here into our second topic, which is the effectiveness of the, of the government response. And uh, Nazik, I want to start with you on, on this uh, on this question. Uh, and I, I, we've heard about the accelerated payments uh, and the designated of industry as critical infrastructure, which is what I was going to ask about. But I think we kind of covered that. Thank you very much for doing so. So I want to focus a little bit on, on the government's role as the partner to industry. Uh, because, uh, you know, your company is a classic case that you're literally, you know, sitting next to in many cases, uh, your customer in the same location, the same installation, uh, in the same office building in many cases. So, uh, you know, it's obviously critical that the government's ability to be a partner and hold up its end of the, of the relationship, uh, be there. Uh, and I think obviously DOD is a tremendously capable, uh, organization has proven that over many, many times in many instances, uh, but they obviously had challenges of their own uh, in dealing with this. So I'd be interested in your assessment of uh, the government's ability to hold up their end of the bargain, if you will, to uh, keep installations open, to, to manage them. You know, some of the issues that General Carlisle raised that are issues for industry or issues for DOD to uh, wrestle with as well on installations. Um, and obviously for, you know, when we get to Mitch, uh, you know, they're, they're, the government representatives are in the plants, uh, and you need that uh, to keep things flowing. So if you wouldn't mind starting us off on this one, Nazik. Sure, Andrew. A great question. I think, um, you know, there's there's so many nuances in, in exactly that question. So I'll just I'll, I'll follow up on the general's comment about PPE. Um, you know, we are, uh, we're leaning forward, um, and, and we're going to require that all employees, uh, CIC employees, in public areas, so, you know, the cafeterias, the conference rooms, the hallways, the restroom, wear, you know, wear face masks. Um, what if a customer doesn't have that same requirement? Then how, you know, how does that impact the employee? What choice then does the employee make? And so I think it's, uh, I think there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, but I think, um, and I, I think, Hawk, it was you that said it's all about communication. And so I've had, uh, you know, tremendous opportunity over the course of these last two or three months to have um, conversations with many of our senior customers uh, because it is important to compare notes. How are we handling the social distancing? How are we handling sending everybody home? What rules are we employing to when you can come to the office and when you can't? And doing that in conjunction with the customers in our case is just the most important thing that we can do. And so that uh, it's an open conversation because at the end of the day, by comparing notes, by comparing best practices, you ultimately end up with a better solution than, than in my opinion, either one of us doing it in isolation. So, uh, so at all levels of our organization, we've, we've just encouraged uh, communication at the program manager level, at the contracts level, at the senior levels, whatever that is, to really look for the best collaborative approach. Um, and so I think, you know, the Andrew, to your question, to me, it is absolutely about that because, as I mentioned, two-thirds of our employees are on customer site. And so it, it doesn't matter a whole lot what decisions we make about our headquarters building. It's important. But at the end of the day, it's supporting the warfighter. It's supporting our customer uh, out in the field that, uh, that defines SAIC and is truly the purpose in, in our mission. And so it, uh, we have to come together. We have to have a common approach. And we have to do it for the well-being of, our, of, of the collective team as well as being able to serve the mission. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, um, you can't do both of those in perfection. You have to get to a compromise. You know, great examples in the intelligence community. You know, we, you can no longer fill a skiff with as many employees as you were able to fill a skiff with before. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, and, and we've, we're all in violent agreement on that. So what does that mean? And how do we go to shift work? And how do we, you know, how do we compromise in the shifts? And how do we look for... Um, you know, maybe there's a scope of work that can be done outside of a skip, and how do we dice and slice that? So, again, I think it all comes down to um, really understanding the collective mission, what we're trying to accomplish, and how we best do that together. And it, it has to be a joining of, in our case, the SAIC team with the customer team to get to that best answer. 
Uh, great. Uh, Mitch, I'd like to turn to you next on this. Uh, you know, I mentioned, obviously, you know, you've got DCMA folks in your plants. Uh, uh, you actually, it occurred to me just now as I was getting ready to turn to you that, you know, you mentioned delivery being a challenge. Uh, and obviously, that's your government customer has to take delivery and maybe do some T&E. So how, how is that going? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, again, it's back to what we've all been saying. It's communication and but again, it's making them also feel safe coming into the facility. So we've had to work really hard to communicate, make sure to clean the facilities. Again, everybody's been talking about it, but social distancing, making sure we wear a mask where we where appropriate. All those things have to be done and we have to demonstrate it and see that it's being done for them to feel safe as well. But, you know, not only do we have to, like you said, we have to have uh, DCMA in, in process checks uh, with parts being produced or, or aircraft being produced, but also we have to have government pilots in to fly out, fly the aircraft, check them out, and get them ready for DD-50, and, of course, have uh, the paperwork executed. And so far, you know, we've actually delivered aircraft uh, ahead of schedule by a month now. So uh, the government customer is in work with us working. Uh, you mentioned the two contracts, Fair and Flara. So you award these right in the middle of it. Normally, we'd have big kickoff meetings. Uh, we'd have several hundred government officials in to start those programs. Uh, we did it virtually. So we never missed the milestone. We, we did them virtually. We had those kickoff meetings with our customer uh, for both Fair and Flara, and we're continuing to execute. And then finally, I think another one we did was uh, we had LOAs in process with foreign military sales. So whether it's the SCA or whoever else we needed, um, we also held virtual meetings with those guys as well to keep the LOAs uh, proceeding as necessary to get the contracts. So, uh, again, that has been pretty responsive so far. Uh Journal, I'll, I'll turn to you next, and I'll just throw in one that uh, sneak in an audience question too that I think would be particularly relevant. Uh, you're obviously working. You mentioned you know at least weekly calls. I imagine you're probably working more like daily uh, when you add in emails and all the other channels of communication and, and with your team uh, with the government on these issues. One one issue that I know has been raised is you know progress payments were accelerated everywhere except apparently a Defense Logistics Agency for uh, some of the small business partners. But, what, what sorts of issues are you seeing in that interaction with the government where, you know, we've talked about things that are working, but we probably ought to also may me mention some of the things that haven't maybe started working yet? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Great question. And, again, I couldn't agree more with it, Nazik, and uh, it said. Um, and, actually, I'd extend the question is how am I doing because uh, I'm the guy between, hopefully, uh, facilitating the com communication. Obviously, we know the government needs to understand what industry is going through, and I'm trying to provide that information to the government uh, several times a week as we have these conversations and I have interaction with Secretary Esper on down, and vice versa. The industry needs to understand what government's going through and what they're trying to do and how they're trying to get there and the, the, the challenges that they're facing. So the question is really as much about NDIA and me and, and Dave Berteau and PSC and Eric Fanning at AIA and, and, and uh, you know, several of the organizations that are working this. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I can't communicate, communicate, communicate. i got to give the government tons of credit because they came on early. I mean, we're at, uh, you know, um, several times a week calls for, for months now. It started in March um, to try to open the lines of communication, and that's, you know, uh, Secretary Lord and Kim Harrington and Dave Lewis at uh, DC, DSCA and, and Daryl Williams at DLA. Everybody's working this. Will Roper, Bruce Jetty, uh, Hondo Gertz, we're all trying to do this. And, and again, I give them a lot of credit. And I think trying to get that consistency across the board. But there's still challenges. Uh, what's an allowable expense? You know, we had to work hard to get the uh, retroactive date for the CARES Act back to 31 January because a lot of government didn't want to start it until uh, March, but we know that the impact started back in January. Um, the accelerated payments for uh, small business, uh, that was a uh, law. And actually DLA, because of their issues with working capital fund, suspended that back in November. Uh, we're trying hard to get it uh, back online. Um, DLA's challenge is they don't have the appropriated funds within their WCF working capital fund. Uh, to be able to accelerate those payments. We're working with Congress to try to give more appropriations through one of the stimulus bills and then uh, getting DLA to get back uh, on to being able to do that with their working capital funds. Um, what's 3610? We're in the process now. What's an allowable expense and what's an equitable adjustments? What's an allowable delay? Um, you know, there's a natural tension there, as there should be. 
uh, ultimately, we're all fighting to help the warfighter do the job we're asking them to do out there. So I think as we continue to go forward, um, what that looks like and, and, and that continuous interaction between government and industry uh, and being able to do that, and that's Congress and the Department both as we move forward. So uh, th those are the things that we're working on, as I mentioned earlier, but I'll say it again, is liability and, and how this how this is going to be in the long run, what this is going to look like, and what kind of challenges it's going to be as we move. Uh, and then if I just, before we leave this topic, uh, just a quick one. Uh, you know, we've been, I guess there's been a lot of dialogue, but not a lot of um, concreteness, I would say, to this issue of what kind of costs are building up that will have to be paid later that will be on top of what was expected. Uh, Mitch, you mentioned that you're actually, you know, operating on schedule or ahead of schedule with deliveries, um, but I'm imagining you're still experiencing CARES Act related leave. So even though you might not be slipping schedule, I would assume there are expenses that are being incurred here that may not have been planned or weren't, weren't in the plan and that might have to be made up later. Is it? Is there a useful way for us in the general public to kind of think about what those cost impacts are likely to be? Well, you know, I think there there are certain things, you know, I think, you know, Hawk did a job mentioning certain ones that have been mentioned, you know, whether it's the PPP and others. Um, you know, there has been a few furloughs in different situations for things. Um, so I think if you think through uh, those costs, we've been allocating them up. So that's kind of what we've been doing right now. Let's just make sure we have a way to capture what it is for right now and then continue to work with like NDIA and others on on how can we get those uh, reimbursed. But yeah, we're we're collecting different costs. We're just saying, hey, anything that was associated with uh, what we're doing uh, regarding this particular situation with COVID, let's grab the costs and, and collect them. But, you know, there's there are some things. And again, across the board, we're gathering them up. We'll see how, how it gets, plays out. Uh, does anyone else feel strongly about jumping in on that question, or I can move us to the next topic if that's okay? I wouldn't mind just uh, just one thing. You know, I, Mitch is exactly right, um, and hopefully I didn't uh, interrupt you. As a, um, so, you know, allowable costs. If, if you, you know, one thing I think is pretty basic for the American population is time is money, right? So if you can't perform on contract and you slide that to the right or you slide deliveries, my hat's off to Bell that they're ahead of schedule. That's phenomenal. That's a tribute to them. Uh, but programs are slipping to the right. And if you slip them to the right and you try to keep your talented workforce engaged, that time becomes money and you're going to have to, you know, you're going to get the same amount of equipment at the end game, but it's going to take you longer, which means you're going to have to pay more to get there. Um, and I just think uh, we got to realize it. Uh, we got to get, you know, there's again, there's natural tension, right? So we have to get the most bang for the buck for the American taxpayer that we can. Um, and, you know, you look at the U.S. economy and it's critical that we have the, you know, the, the that part of the dime equation is the economic impact. Uh, so we got to get the most bang for our buck, but we also got to be equitable and fair about it is going to cost more if you take more time to do things and you can't perform on time. Yeah, I'll just echo exactly that. I don't, I don't have much to add, but in a people-centric business, um, as you mentioned, General, it, it really is around the time. And if, if you know, the, the good news is the CARES Act took care of some of the elements of, of you know making sure people were ready and at the ready, and so we'll continue to manage that. But um, you know, but there are there are aspects of being able to be ready, whether it's healthcare issues or additional leave. Uh, illness, things like that, that uh, that we continue to just navigate best we can. But uh, but I think it is around the the concept of people's time is money, and how do you best uh, ensure that you're you're collecting that data if and when you need it. Well, thank you for that. And I want to transition us to the uh, third topic, which is on uh, the war for talent. Uh, and I think we've got exactly the right people here to talk about this because. Uh, you know, and Nazik, in your case, you know, your company is all about your people. Uh, they are essentially the product in many ways that you're selling. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's been a war for talent that the defense industry has been engaged with, uh, with every other industry in the economy, but notably with some, uh, some 800 pound gorillas like the tech sector and others, uh, who can pay very well, uh, and, uh, are now gargantuan, you know, corporate giants, uh, that are tough competitors in this area. Uh, and, you know, it strikes me that this current um, this current crisis that we're going through is going to be something that 
you know, obviously we're, we're in it, uh, and we don't know how long it'll last. So we may be dealing with it for quite a long time. Uh, but even once it eases, perhaps to some extent, it's going to be something that colors the way people think about their employers, their careers, their, their futures, how they, how they want to live their life. Uh, so how do you see, at least at the, I know we're in the early stages probably for this question, but how do you see this war for talent impacting, uh, or this crisis, excuse me, impacting on this war for talent that, that we're all engaged in? You want me to go first? Okay. Uh, so, you, you know, you, you absolutely touched on it. It is um, for SAIC, uh, you know, we're a technology integrator, but our, you know, our basic uh, and most valuable asset is our talent and it is our people. And so we have been on this journey, as you mentioned, uh, for the last couple of years. And, um, and I think in some ways, um, you know, this, as with anything, there's goods and bads. And, and although, you know, none of us would ever, ever wish for a pandemic, um, is, you know, there are some positive aspects of, um, of where we sit today as it relates to the war for talent. First and foremost, we've been able to continue to hire. And, um, and so, you know, that's great news. And so it's great to be able to provide jobs to people that might have lost their jobs in other industries, uh, to be able to bring on great talent and, uh, and to be able to the, you know, to the best of our ability, make, uh, make our impact in, in the overall, uh, economic challenges. And so we've been very pleased with that. We've moved, um, as with everything else, you know, we've moved to a very virtual environment, virtual interviews, virtual offers. And in many cases, you know, the, the people start virtually. They start, uh, their first day of work is at their home. And so, um, and so again, being able to navigate this, um, this particular work environment, uh, especially as it relates to technology driven jobs has been, has been an uh, advantage for us. The other aspect, um, that, uh, that I know will, will resonate with folks on this, uh, on this call is that, uh, the type of work that we do, the mission critical type of work we do, uh, the purpose driven aspect of who we are and what we do in serving the nation, uh, is, is very important to people. And, um, and so being able to continue to do that during this pandemic and this crisis speaks to people in more than just the paycheck. Uh, it, it really does, uh, connect individuals to a broader purpose, to a broader calling and to, to being able to really make an impact to our nation. And, and that has been something that uh, I've had the privilege of talking with lots of employees that, um, is always important to many. But, uh, but as we sit here today has been another aspect of how SAIC has been able to navigate this. So I am thrilled that we continue to, to see opportunity to hire people. We've been able to hire a couple thousand folks over the last uh, few months, and we continue to have the technology and the tools to be able to do that in whatever the new normal is, but certainly in today's normal uh, as we go forward. Um, and, 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 you know, to the extent that we can make an impact in certain geographies or areas and provide jobs, we're very, very pleased to be able to do that. Uh, let me turn to you next, Mitch, because obviously with the with the contract awards, uh, major contract awards, you're obviously in the thick, I would assume, of uh, trying to yeah. staff up uh, and and execute. Now, you may have done some of that ahead of time if you're being forward leaning and optimistic. But nonetheless, you can't only do so much until you actually win a contract. So uh, how how is that going? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's it, it's pretty similar to what Azik said. You know, it's um, I don't know if it's because of the other industries that may be, you know, hurting at this this point, but. Uh, at this point, you know, we've had no problem really bringing folks on. We've continued to meet our ramp and, and meet the staffing appropriately. Uh, but as she said also, it's, it's to me, our value proposition has got to be more than just, hey, I can pay you more. Uh, again, we're, we're going to have a shortage. We know we have a shortage. We've got to encourage the STEM down into our, our grade schools and, and uh, into our high schools. We do a robotics competition, a vertical robotics competition, try and get kids excited. Um, but it's come back to the uh, the mention of the overall mission. You know, do you get to support your warfighter? There's a fair amount of patriotism there. Uh, our commercial side of the business, emergency medical uh, helicopters that go out and rescue people uh, every day or, or law enforcement. So there's a connection that you need to get with the mission. Uh, but it's more of a whole package deal to come to us uh, and wrap it around that as opposed to just, hey, we can pay you more. So and again, with winning these two big contracts, there's definitely a need of talent. Uh, and, you know, how many chances do you get to go design brand new platforms that the Army is going to fly for the next 40 years? And so there's some excitement around that, as well as on our commercial uh, side of the business, looking at uh, air taxis, uh, different kind of propulsion techniques. So, again, it's the excitement of what you're doing and the excitement of the mission that I think right now is still drawn. So we've we've not had a problem yet. 
Uh, General Carlisle, anything on uh, the kind of the war for talent perspective? No, I just uh, I'd agree with bo what both Nasik and uh, Mitch said. You know that there is a, a, a one bright spot. Plot, and that is the fact that uh, during this time, the defense industrial base has been kind of a safe shelter uh, with respect to uh, essentiality of working and keeping people employed and, and staying on. Uh, so that's a positive thing. But I think the long term outlook is as a nation, uh, we have got a workforce challenge and we have got to address it both in STEM uh, and, and keeping people excited. The defense industrial base is going to deal with it in the future. Um, I think everything that companies like Bell and SAIC are doing is critically important. And I couldn't uh, reiterate more the value of um, you're doing something that matters. Uh, it's bigger than yourself and you're making a difference. And obviously both Bell and SAIC do that every single day with every one of their employees. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, people want to do something that's important. Uh, and that's the way that we continue to go after the challenges of the uh, talent. Uh, and attracting them to the defense industrial base because it's critically important for our future. Well, thank you. And again, that's another great segue. Um, I'm going to turn now to some audience questions. I will say our final discussion topic is uh, risks and opportunities for the future, but hopefully our audience is submitting questions that are squarely in that issue set. So I want I want to ask those rather than uh, throwing, uh, throwing my own in at this point. Uh, so there's actually been two or three questions submitted about this issue of automation and whether the situation that we're currently in is creating uh, a strong dynamic to increase uh, automation to reduce kind of the dependency on human labor, I guess, um, grim as it is maybe to think about that, but uh, or maybe to reduce the need for humans to be in close proximity to one another. Uh, and that does seem like kind of a long-term risk or opportunity uh, for, for defense industry. Uh, and, and General, if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe starting us off, if you could, do you see among your membership uh, a push for greater au automation or a push to maybe uh, talk to the government about opportunities to increase automation? Is that something uh, or do you think that's more of a longer term uh, issue at this point? No, I think I think the new normal is going to be different. I think automation is a big factor. I think um, uh, that we've you know, I, industry has already been doing it. I'd venture to say that Mitch, when he talks about his manufacturing of these two new helicopters, uh, the the type of manufacturing floor that he's going to have is wholly different than what he had in the past. I mean, it, we are going to more automation. We in the United States military uh, went to in a lot of ways with unmanned aerial vehicles, um, you know, remotely piloted uh, where that was an automation. If you add in quantum and, and artificial intelligence as part of that, that goes up even more drastically. Uh, un, unmanned undersea vehicles, uh, UUVs, uh, unmanned uh, fighting vehicles for the Army. So the automation part of it, whether it's manufacturing, uh, whether it's uh, the remotely operated or controlled capability. But the point I would make is there's still uh, people in the loop. And so where you put them in the loop is just going to change. I think SAIC will be a great example of that because they'll provide some of that incredible expertise of putting people in the loop in the right place for automated systems and capability. So, you know, what will happen, I believe, and what we found with the with RPAs and, you know, the MQ-9s and RQ-4s were you could do so with the same number of people, you could do so much more. You could control four different caps of MQ-9s all at one time and, and be able to provide real-time ISR and delivery capability. You'll be able to do more with submarines for detection and understanding where your potential adversaries are. So I, I think, you know, automation is going to be a big part of it. It's going to move people to a different part of the of the loop. And I think that's part of the, the quest for talent as we go forward. I mentioned if you wouldn't mind maybe taking that one next uh, and, and what you're seeing with, uh, with automation or, or what you're planning for. Well, you know, Hawk said it, you know, if you look at the new, the new, you know, the, the way we build things today, it's, it's going to be hard to switch over. You know, all those processes were certified by the government agencies. So the way we build those products, uh, they'll play out. Now, that's not saying that new things that we're coming up with in terms of automation, we can't retrofit back in because we can. But, um, in fact, we're breaking ground, uh, here in the next month or so on our new manufacturing technology center, which is going to be our showpiece for how we're gonna have automation and robotics build these aircraft in the future. So uh, we're actually moving that way, you have to move that way. You know, really what enabled it was the whole digital 
the digital thread and digital design of aircraft, the fact that, you know, now that we have those all in that space, uh, makes it much easier to build the tooling and, and the machinery to actually perform those tasks, uh, perform them at a high rate and also at high quality and lower cost. And so that's kind of the direction we're moving anyway. And again, we're looking at what we can retrofit back in, but that's, that's where we're headed with our new, our new products. How's it? Uh, yeah, so I, uh, I think the, the only thing I'll add is I totally agree with, um, Hawk, what you said about, you know, where, where the labor is in the, in the stream. So it doesn't, um, you know, it just changes what people are doing. And, and I don't think we have any, any choice as a nation is, you know, to, to adopt tech, uh, technology, to do, uh, adopt automation, uh, across, you know, many, many aspects of what we do. And the way I view it is it's a, it's a force multiplier. It, uh, it allows us to be so much better and do so much more uh, with the tools and technologies that we have. And so, um, so I, you know, I, I just I view it as a very positive thing. I think it's, um, again, it will continue to put the demand on the war for talent because you have to have people that know how to engineer and deploy the automation. Uh, but it's but it's absolutely a force multiplier and a must, uh, you know, a must do for our for our nation. Well, thank you. We're we're coming up to the end of our time here, but I did want to try and fit in one more, and I don't know how long it'll take to answer because I don't know how much you'll want to say about it, any of you. Uh, But we did get a question about the, uh, you know, the funding that was set aside specifically for businesses uh, that are uh, engaged in national security uh, work. It was a $17 billion uh, kind of special uh, allocation under the CARES Act uh, for essentially defense industry. Uh, and, uh, you know, reporting would suggest that they're just, they're, it's been allocated, not that many companies have applied for it. Uh, I'm not being very articulate here, but that there's been limited take up uh, on that. Uh, and, and I guess there have been a lot of restrictions on how it's, uh, how it's allocated. So, uh, General, I don't know if you've engaged in that debate about who should be eligible for that fund, uh, but any thoughts you might have on whether that's, there's reasons why maybe the industry hasn't engaged as aggressively on that. Uh, allocation of assistance as we might have thought uh, and and ways that it could be made better perhaps yeah I, I actually have and I'll try to keep this short because I know Mitch and Isaac will probably want to say something as well but you know at the end of the day it was fairly restrictive the the rules that were put around that 17 billion dollars for many companies public and private companies they would have a hard time uh, taking that money and then following uh, the restrictions and rules and still being good stewards of their company's uh, uh, futures as they move forward for how long it would affect them in the future and what they were allowed to do in the future, whether it was future contracts, future access to capital, and how they did things. So, you know, I think the restrictions, the intent was good, but the restrictions were too uh, too onerous in many cases. And so many of the companies, again, both public and private, felt like uh, they would find other ways to make uh, to make it work. Um, some businesses were, and for some businesses it would work, but I think the low request for it was because the level of restrictions and what would do to those companies in the future. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're a free market society and we have earnings per share and companies have to be able to chart their future. Uh, and in this case, I think uh, many companies, that money was in, it would inhibit their ability to move into the future. And so I think if uh, Congress could find a way working with the department and the defense uh, industry uh, representatives to lighten up some of those restrictions that may be. Uh... Thanks. Uh, Mitch, Nozick, either one of you want to speak to the $17 billion fund? I can jump in real quick here. You know, I think, and maybe it's just, again, we're a very fortunate situation right now uh, with the supply chain still working, everything working. We actually had the best first quarter we have in the last two or three years, and uh, we're having a really good second quarter right now. And our productivity is actually up. Absenteeism is down from what it mm-hmm. normally historically has been. I think everybody's coming to work. They're focused on work and and getting it done. So honestly, we didn't need any financial assistance. We're we're doing very well. I, I think the bigger question is what you had earlier is as as we start to see, you know, experience delays, uh, maybe one of our supply chains shuts back down again, or there's a second wave and things hit us again. Uh, as as that starts impacting our business and the cost in our business, is is that going to be allowable or not? As we try and get reimbursed, but you know, again, we're we're delivering out a contract and we're very productive right now, so we just didn't need that assistance. Yeah, Andrew, I would just echo that. I think uh, 
uh, again, you know, the, the vast majority of our employees are serving their mission every day. They might be doing it from a different location. They did it three months ago, um, but they're they're working in partnership with uh, with their government customer and they're delivering on the mission. And so, um, you know, we've I certainly wouldn't say we haven't been impacted. I think you know every company out there in some form or fashion has been impacted by this uh, by this uh, pandemic. But in general, uh, we continue to do well. We continue to support the missions, and, and our employees are, are working. And so uh, we're very, very fortunate to be in that situation. Uh, well, thank you for that. And, Nazik, I think you're going to get the last word here other than my own. Uh, so uh, I just want to thank very much everyone for uh, tuning in today, for joining us for this discussion. Uh, for me, it's been incredibly helpful to get uh, such a detailed uh, insight into uh, different sectors of the defense industry, how they're being impacted by the COVID crisis, uh, and how uh, to think about possibly some of those trends uh, in the coming months uh, and beyond, uh, and, and how that's likely to play out. Uh, and so very helpful. Uh, appreciate all three of you very much for joining us today, especially with uh, uh, giving us some of your valuable time uh, in this uh, challenging period. Uh, and for those who are viewing, again, I'd uh, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, do check out uh, other products, if you can, on the CSIS website that are looking at uh, COVID across the economy and across a whole a wide range of issues, uh, and specifically our updates on uh, COVID and its impact on the Department of Defense. Uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you again in the future. Thank you.